Colonel. <clears throat> That's the NPS DS word of the day. <clears throat> Excuse me, Colonel, as in Colonel Sanders. Did you know that Garth Brooks wore a Sanders jersey? People actually thought it was Bernie Sanders. I thought it was Colonel Sanders. It turns out it was Barry Sanders. He was playing in Detroit. It was an actual Detroit Lions jersey. Yet everyone lost their minds. Now, granted, his fans probably are anti-Bernie Sanders, but why don't you sort of pay attention as to context? By the way, 37 years ago, Colonel Blake and Colonel Potter left the air. It's my second colonel. That's why it's the word of the day. It's not a double entendre. It's two reasons. The final MASH episode 37 years ago today, Colonel Potter, Colonel Blake, Colonel Sanders, Garth Brooks. Really? Bernie Sanders? Come on. It was Barry. Jerry Jones takes showers. That is the update for everyone watching on CBS Sports HQ. For everybody listening to this show, wherever you get your podcasts, I appreciate it. We had a quote from an owner yesterday, the likes of which I've never heard. I've given quotes for 18 years of my life. I've never discussed that which I think about in the shower. The good news for us is that now we know exactly what Jerry Jones is doing in the shower. He talked about two things yesterday. We're going to have to deal with them both because they both matter. The first one is about his quarterback. Is anyone sick of talking about Dak Prescott? They haven't signed him. We've got people at CBS, Sports HQ, everywhere who are talking about, just sign him, put the tag on him, don't tag him, find a way, give him the money you were going to give to Wentz, even though that's a different team, obviously. But if you can get it done with Wentz, why can't you get it done with Prescott? All of these sorts of things. Well, if you've ever run a team, you know very well what's happening. When there is a disagreement between what a player is worth and what an owner thinks a player is worth, you're going to have a problem. But Jerry Jones may have tipped his proverbial, proverbial cap. Here's the quote, folks. It's the same. This is Jerry Jones talking about a quarterback. It's not like it's Roger Staubach or Tony Romo. This is about his current quarterback. It's the same as I feel for Steven. By the way, for those playing at home, or even if you're alone, it is Stephen as in his son, his actual son. It's the same as I feel for Stephen. There's no going forward without him, so we have to figure it out. This is a deal that I ultimately have to do. Quote over. If the quote ended there, if I'm Prescott, that's it. I win. He thinks of me like I'm his son, and he knows that there is no moving forward. Therefore, I'm going to sit back. I'm going to ask for everything extra I can think of in my contract negotiation. I'm going to find out a way. To, I'm going to get more seats. I'm going to get more private plane hours. I'm going to get maybe even a little stipple of the team. I'm going to get something because I know that he can't go forward without me. This is a deal that I ultimately have to do. End of quote. Nope. The quote goes on. He says four more words. Not four more years, four more words. It's got to fit. Now, for the grammarians, I could say it is as in it's, but no. It's got to fit. That's the out. That is the out that you need if you are running a team. Now, Jerry Jones, as you very well know, is his own GM, and he's the owner. So he's really just talking to himself and amongst himself when he's figuring out what to do. But he gave himself the GM gave the owner, or maybe the owner gave the GM. I think in this case, he was talking as the owner of the team, telling the GM of the team that it's got to fit. Or it could have been the GM of the team talking, saying to the owner, given the payroll that you gave me as owner, this has to fit. Maybe it was the owner and the GM both inside the same brain saying, hey, I don't know what to do here because I know that he's probably not the guy who's going to lead us to a potential next Super Bowl. And do I really want to maybe go after one of the other five or six quarterbacks that are playing musical quarterback chairs right now? The music is playing. It's supposed to stop when Tom Brady chooses where he's going. But frankly, the Cowboys may want to get in on it because Jerry Jones is that type of guy. So you're thinking to yourself three minutes into this, if you're watching on HQ, or even if you're listening, when, what's the whole shower thing? 
Well, the shower thing is regarding one of the top five wide receivers to ever play for the Dallas Cowboys. This is a guy that we have not talked about one time on this show. He's sort of not on anybody's radar. He's been hurt. A guy named, who remembers, Des Bryant. Des Bryant has a guy, remember he was on the Saints, didn't even play, got hurt. And he left the Cowboys under who, not great circumstances. Jerry Jones actually said, when asked about Des Bryant, I've thought a lot about this in the shower. Now let's forego all the sidebar commentary. Don't DM me or tweet at me at David P. Sampson. Don't do anything and say, don't discuss Jerry Jones's proclivities in the shower. This is not a sexual issue. This is me telling you that when I ran the team, I had many of my greatest moments in the shower. I was thinking about all sorts of business things. I get what he's doing, but I would never have said it publicly. No one cares when you're having the great ideas because then you've got a show like mine, nothing personal like ours, where we say, hey, what exactly are you thinking about, Des? You're going to give him another chance? You think you're going to sign him because he's working out, he's getting ready, and he said he's ready to play again? I get that you want to give support. I have so many ex-players all over. They're playing for other teams. Some of them are retired. Just there are hundreds of them, right? We've talked about it on Nothing Personal. You go back and look at an old team photo, and it's really hard even as a GM or a president to remember every single player. But you're going to remember your best ones. If I had one of my old best players, let's say a Miguel Cabrera, who was hurt and wanted to come back, even though he's under contract with Detroit, so I know that's a bad example, but someone who you had a relationship with who was one of the best in your absolute uh, a, a working relationship, obviously, but one of the absolute best players, you'd want to find a way to maybe bring him back. But in this case, the Cowboys have too many things to do to get their team turned around. They're starting with a new coach, and believe me, this new coach from Green Bay, he's got a different way of operating. He's going to want to at all times deal with only the GM and not the owner. So Jerry Jones is going to have to be super careful when he's meeting with Mike, his new coach, how he talks because he doesn't want to necessarily talk to an owner. He wants to talk players, player personnel. And for me, when you look back at Dez, eh, 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 it's an old name. Okay, I'm, I'm getting back to Mason Saunders now. This is not Colonel Sanders, if you heard my word of the day, which was Colonel Saunders, Sanders, as in Barry Sanders. No, this is about Mason Saunders. You may know him as another name that he uses, Madison Baumgartner. So this guy goes by two names. During the day, he's a pitcher for now the Arizona Diamondbacks, and we've talked about it on the show. At night, he's Mason Saunders, where he's some rodeo guy, where he basically takes rope and gets it around animals. This is a huge, huge story in baseball. The reason is that it's so big is that everybody wants to know, what's the deal here, Madison? Why do you have an alias? Did you think and realize what, how wrong it was, what you were doing? Did you think to yourself that you were maybe putting your contract in jeopardy by doing this prohibited activity? Tell me exactly what was in your mind. Madison Baumgartner took the mound for the first time this spring for the Arizona Diamondbacks after they signed him to $85 million over five years. Guess what happened after the game? At spring training, it's sort of very simple. Pitchers pitch for one or two innings. The, all the reporters are in the press box watching the starting pitcher pitch. As soon as the starting pitcher leaves the game, the starting pitcher heads right back to the clubhouse. Then all of the reporters follow the starting pitcher. They go to the clubhouse, and there's immediate media availability. It's not like the regular season where it happens after a game. During spring training, the media meets the starting pitcher during the game. Why? Because the starting pitcher then gets dressed and is gone on the golf course or at the rodeo or getting his clown makeup on or doing something else before the game even ends. If you asked Mason Saunders today what was the final score of the game that Madison Baumgartner started in, he would have no idea. By the way, neither would Madison. So the reporters come into the clubhouse. He's wearing his Diamondbacks hat. He's got his beard on. Thank God he didn't sign with the Yankees. First question, um, were you aware what a big situation it was that you were participating in a rodeo? And Madison Baumgartner said, you know, I really didn't think I had my best stuff, but it was really nice to be 
back on the mound. I felt good to be in a Diamondbacks uniform. And I just want to say that uh, I like where my arm is right now. Sec, any other questions? Yeah, can you please comment on the fact that you have an alias and that you were roping cows, calves, horses, pigs, donkeys, like, and making $26,000? And he answered, and he said, one of the things that I like today is I like the movement on my breaking ball. I thought I had decent movement on the fastball, just getting comfortable on the mound. I was just sort of starting, just sort of starting my spring training progress. Third question. I'm sorry, Madison, um, one more time. Can you please explain to me what the situation is with the rodeo? He looked right at the reporter in the eyes, and he said, I really do think that my arm's doing well. I really am pleased with my progress so far. Hey, Madison, you don't get to do that. You don't get to get $85 million and then not answer a question from a new team. This is the first spring training, the first time you've been in front of the media of the Arizona Diamondbacks. If I'm Derek Hall, who is the president of the Arizona Diamondbacks, I am marching right down to the clubhouse. I am going to see Madison before he gets out. This is after I met with him about this whole rodeo situation. This is after I explained that that is a prohibited activity. You better not do it again because I'll void your contract so fast that your rope will swing. But hey, Madison, don't you think we're going to have to address this issue? Don't you think there's a chance? Excuse me. Don't you think there's a small chance that you're going to have to tell our fans? Remember what we say about meeting the media. It's always about talking to the fans. Don't you think we're going to have to answer the question about whether the fans realize that your main priority is the Arizona Diamondbacks and getting us to the postseason, maybe breaking the Los Angeles Dodgers streak of winning the division, maybe getting us to our first World Series since the 2001 championship? Don't you think that that's something you're going to have to answer? And no matter what Madison says, as president, I'm saying to him, you have to answer that. I am telling you, you must address this. If you don't want to do it in a press conference, fine. If you want to do it as a scrum, which is when a bunch of reporters come to your locker at the end of an appearance, that's fine. But don't you dare talk down to our fans by pretending you don't hear the question. Of course he heard the question. One day I'll understand why players act the way they do. They just think we're, they think we're all stupid. Makes me crazy. Okay, so I found out there's something called Venmo. As um, Venmo is a... Um, an app on a phone, apparently you can get or give money on Venmo. What you do is you press a button and all of a sudden you've got a dollar less and somebody has a dollar more. That's the concept. I guess people are using it when they want to split food at a restaurant or they want to split the cost of something. They each Venmo each other. I guess there's a whole world of Venmo. I think that's great. Um, something happened in the sports world yesterday that made me laugh and it made me jealous that I'm now at CBS Sports HQ and no longer running a team because apparently people are now Venmoing money to the New York Mets general manager, Brody Van Wagenen, in the hopes that he will spend that money to acquire more and better players. Let's make sure we have that straight. There are people who are taking their hard-earned, after-tax money, they are Venmoing it, which I guess can be a verb. Coca, is Venmo a verb? They are Venmoing, maybe it's a, whatever part of speech it is, adverb. They're Venmoing money to Brody Van Wagenen. I don't know what you do with money when it's Venmoed. I don't know if it comes as cash or if you get it out of a machine or whatever the case may be. But what's interesting is it goes right into your bank account. So Brody Van Wagenen is getting rich off people who are giving him money. Now, am I giving a little bit of hyperbole? Yeah, you know why? Because people are sending pennies and they're sending dollars and they're doing it really to show that they want the Mets to do more and spend more and be better. Brody Van Wagenen needs to stand up and tell people the following. Attention, all personnel. Please do not Venmo me any money. The reason is that I'm not going to use any of that money to sign any more players. 
because I get a budget from the owner of the team whose name is Fred Wilpon. When Fred tells me that my payroll can be $150 million, your Venmoing of another $1.50 does not enable me to trade for or sign additional Major League talent. Please take that money and donate it to charity. In the meantime, I'm going to take everything that I've been Venmoed and I'm going to donate it to the New York Mets Community Foundation. If I'm Brody Van Wagenen, now this is being back to David Sampson. If I'm Brody Van Wagenen, I'm taking advantage of this moment to explain, one, that I am not culpable in what the final payroll of the team is. Two, I'm going to explain to my fans that whatever the payroll is, I've got enough payroll in order to give you a winning team. I don't want my owner to be blamed. I don't want me to be anything other than responsible for how good or bad the Mets are. Three, it gives an opportunity to explain to people that with their money, they should not be sending it to me, but should be doing it to make a bigger difference in the world. Why not give it to a charity? Why not get some good publicity out of this? The thing the Mets have suffered from so much is that they've had such bad publicity this entire offseason, whether it was the aborted sale to Steve Cohn, the billionaire hedge fund guy, who, by the way, after what's going on in the financial markets, it's possible he's no longer a billionaire, or he's lost more than he would have paid for the Mets. My guess is he wishes he had taken some of the money in the market and put it toward the entire Mets franchise, which in no way went down as much as some of the holdings in the market. The Mets have not caught a break not one. Cespedes not talking to the media. Now he is talking to the media. He wants to play opening day. He rode a wild boar into an ankle trap and broke his foot and his ankle. The Mets need a break. They had another opportunity. This is what we talk about on Nothing Personal. When you have an opportunity to turn a story around, you take it. And this Venmo was a perfect opportunity for Brody Van Wagenen to actually relate to his fans. Instead of what he does, which is walk into a spring training game, sign autographs and take pictures like he's a rock star, like he doesn't realize that at the end of the day, he's going to get fired like every other GM, team president and manager always ends up getting fired. That the story and the stars are the players, not himself. He will come to realize all of those things. And this was his moment. He could have just stood up and said to all of the Venmoers, stop Venmoing me. What am I supposed to do with your pennies? If you want to Venmo me money, how about Venmo me $30 million? Then I would have signed Garrett Cole. But for a penny and a dollar? Nah, not going to do it. Oh, God, do I want sushi so badly. I had a great lunch today. I ordered, uh, actually, Quinn who may be here, Quinn Snyder, who works, has a very important job at CBS Sports HQ. Her job is to make sure that all of the egos in the room are all sort of satiated, taken care of. She subjugates herself every step of the way to take care of whatever we need. And God, did we have a need today. I needed food. So I got a sandwich from a place called um, Press. It was a press sandwich, which I guess is a triple entendre because you press it down. That was a free advertisement, Coke. I shouldn't have done it. You know what, press, if you're listening, I want sandwiches for Quinn twice a week, not for Coca, just for Quinn. So it got me thinking about food. I watched a movie about two, three, four, five years ago. I watched it again maybe two weeks ago. It's called Jiro Dreams of Sushi. This is a documentary about the single greatest sushi restaurant in the entire world. And it is located in the subway station of a subway station in Tokyo. It is a place you cannot get into. Reservations, forget about it. You need six months and then you're not going to get in. The total number of people who can be there at once is about 12. The menu at Jiro is no menu. You eat exactly what he tells you to eat in the exact manner in which he tells you to eat it. He is the Vincent Van Gogh of chefs, except he's got two ears. He is the ultimate in perfectionist. He makes a piece of sushi. He makes the rice. He cuts the fish. He puts the wasabi on. He does it all in a way that it's magic. 
and this is a documentary about the process that he goes through. This man who's in his 90s, who is teaching, listen, when you are a sushi chef, not a sous chef, a sushi chef in Tokyo or anywhere, it is a huge, huge honor. And when you're Jiro, it is the number one honor. I'm not a foodie, I will grant you that. Do you know that the greatest food moment of my entire life is when I went to Jiro. I was in Tokyo, went with Ichiro. Look, if you're not looking at that photo, that is Ichiro, as in the player. PJ Loyello, Jiro, I don't know who the guy is next to Jiro because I'm not supposed to know him, then me, and then Jeff Conine. Of course, that's Michael Hill, the president of Baseball Ops for the Marlins. We went because we were doing something with Ichiro, like sign him to a contract, and Ichiro took us to Jiro. The whole restaurant was closed. I got to go to Jiro. I mean, this is the number one perk. People always ask me, what's the greatest perk you ever had running the Marlins? Was it talking to players? Was it traveling on a team plane? Was it being in a World Series locker room? Was it holding a World Series trophy? Was it wearing a ring? What was the number one perk ever? You're looking at a picture of it. The number one perk I ever had is getting to go to Jiro and getting to go when the entire restaurant was closed down just for Ichiro. Ichiro took us. We went there and ate, and it was... I'm trying to explain what it was like, and I get actually paid to articulate my thoughts and feelings and opinions, and I'm practically speechless. Here's what it was like. I want you to picture in your own life. Picture something that is completely unattainable, but not because you don't have the physical attributes or financial wherewithal to do it. So it can't be that you're 5'5 and you want to dunk a basketball, right? We've talked about that. I'll never be able to dunk a basketball. I don't want to dunk a basketball. I can't dunk a basketball. It can't be about a hole-in-one at the Masters in the final round, right? That's not reasonable. But what about something that is absolutely has nothing to do with money because you can afford to eat there? It's totally attainable because it's just going to a restaurant. It's just total matter of fact that you happen to be in a situation where you're able to get a reservation or get into the place, and there he is your culinary hero. He is making your sushi. You are eating a 26-course meal of fish that you can't ask what it is. You're not allowed to. He prints a menu every day, but it's in Japanese. You don't know, and you look at Ichiro, and you learn that, do you know, you don't use chopsticks. You use your fingers. You don't use soy sauce. You don't use wasabi. You don't do anything except you pick up the piece from the table that's put right in front of you, you put it in your mouth, then you wipe your hands on a washcloth that is put in front of you. Not a napkin used to wipe your face, it's a washcloth to wipe your fingers. And you're doing this sitting next to the Beatles of baseball in Japan, who's Ichiro, people who you're very close friends with, and then Jiro. So when you have an opportunity, Watch the movie Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Sushi. Learn what it's like to have the discipline to actually want to do something so perfectly that you will die at 120 years old and you still will not be able to do that skill in the perfect way in which you want. That's the movie. Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Okay. So you want to talk to Samson, it's time. I got so much reaction to yesterday's show. Yesterday's So You Want to Talk to Samson was about Coca, how we met, and how he became the producer. Um, so, so You Want to Talk to Samson is when people DM me at David P. Samson. You can follow me at David P. Samson and then give me something to talk about, and the odds are I will. If you're watching this on YouTube, what this means is I don't have a water sponsor. I'm holding up a bottle of water that has no label on it. There's no way I'm giving free advertising to any company. This is nothing personal. It's business. We need a water sponsor. Let's go. So So You Want to Talk to Samson came, apparently, I have no recollection of this, apparently I went on a bit of a Scott Boris rant about Jose Fernandez and about Kobe Bryant and about Alexis Altabelli. 
And uh, the rant was obviously about Scott Boris and about how he is completely useless once a player can't make him money anymore, which he is in every way, like completely useless. Someone DM'd me immediately and said, based on that conversation, what type of engagement do you want an agent to have with a player or a player's family? Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Because I don't want to be the type of person who does this show and I tell you what I don't like, but I refuse to tell you what I do like. Where I only give you examples of what I wouldn't do and I don't give you examples of what I would do. I try not to do that, but in this case, you got me. I didn't tell you what I do want to see in an agent-player relationship. And I'm going to right now. Here's how it starts. An agent is someone who has to pay attention to a young kid in baseball, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, because they get drafted out of high school. The majority of baseball players are drafted out of high school, and agents are going around trying to get players all the time. They're trying to get other agents, existing MLB players, in order to poach them away, and they're trying to fill their pipeline. It's the same as any salesman. An agent is just a salesman. An agent is, and I say just, not like they're Willie Loman. I'm not saying anything against salespeople. Trust me, we're all in sales. You are in sales. If you are listening to this show and you are watching this show, if you are breathing any sort of air at the moment, you're in sales. If you're not good at sales, all it means is you never get what you want. So if you're the type of person who's always doing what other people want, who never feels like you're getting what you want, it means you're not too good at selling. If you're selfish and you always get to do what you want, you're really good at selling because you're telling other people what you want to do and they're doing it with you. Agents have to sell. They've got to sell their differentiating factors to these kids and to the kids' parents. They have to go to the parents and say, I'm going to take care of everything for your son. I'm going to make sure your son has the best equipment, the best, the best sponsorship deals for gloves, for shoes, for clothes. I'm going to make sure that your son is making money off the field, not just on the field. I'm going to make sure that I will never forget about your child. And then you do that to 100 kids of which only two of them have a chance to ever have a cup of coffee in the big leagues. So is it true that 98 times out of 100 you're making a promise to kids that never is going to come true because the kid's going to get drafted and then not make it or the kid won't even get drafted or the kid as coming out of high school end up going to college and then not be as good or get drafted after three years of college and still not make it to the big leagues? That's the reality of life. So I have no issue with agents doing that with high school kids. You've got to get hundreds of them in your pipeline. You've got to promise them the world because high school kids, if they don't know they should, you're not going to make it. Not. But what about the big league players that the agents have? What do I expect of that? What do I exactly want between an agent and a big league player? I want that agent to make sure that that player is making the right decision. I don't want that agent to step back and say, I'm giving you all the options, you then choose whatever you want. I want the agent to take a vested interest in the future of that player, both on and off the field. I want the agent to treat the player like family, which is what they pretend they are when they sign them. I want the agent to have an opportunity to tell a player when they disagree with what the player's doing off the field or on the field. I want a player to be able to speak to the agent's wife or the agent's family, the agent's parents, the agent's kids, the, 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 ki the player's brothers, the player's sisters, whoever, if the player is doing something that he shouldn't be doing, if the player is involved in drugs, as an example, if the player is doing things off the field that is not helping the player's performance on the field, I want the agent to get involved. If that means tattling on the player to the player's parents, I want you to do it. Your job is to help save a player from himself. I'm only a team president, and I thought that was my job. I didn't succeed every time, and I don't expect agents to succeed every time, but I expect you to try every time. And I don't expect you to only try with the players who you think are going to make you money and ignore players who can no longer make you money because they just stink. If you want to hand off a player who can't make you as much money and you want to give it to someone else in your agency, someone lower down the food chain, no problem. 
I do that too. I don't have time to deal with the superstars and also the 26th and the 40th man. I'm going to take the time to say hello when I can, but I'm going to make sure there's other people in my organization who are taking care of the 29th man on the roster, the 25th man, the 40th man. I agree there's only so many hours in a day. But the question is, do I have the responsibility to make sure that it never ends? And the answer is I do. I want the agent to be engaged enough with the player that when that player's done in baseball, that that agent knows what that player's doing. Once that player is done, you can then sever relationships. And that is a legal term where if that player then makes money as a dentist or as a doctor or as a spokesperson, that the agent would not take a cut of that. I am fine with the relationship ending. But while a player is playing, and right after a player is done playing, it is your job to make sure that you or someone in your shop, in your company, is at least pretending to pay attention. It's not that much to ask. It's just not. At CBS Sports HQ, we've had... Um, I'm trying to hear from the gallery. I think we've had people at the Combine for six weeks. I'm pretty sure Tommy Tran has been assigned to Indianapolis. I think he has a month-to-month -month lease at an apartment downtown. He's been on the air on HQ if you've been watching. He's been with Brady Quinn, different than Quinn, the person who helped us with lunch today. He's been with Pete Prisco, all of our guys from CBS Sports HQ. Non-stop. It's the biggest media event ever. It's like the Super Bowl. It's unbelievable. News came out yesterday that is my all-time favorite news. That's not even an exaggeration. And by the way, I'm going to admit something that most people in sports will never admit, but I will tell you. If something ever comes up, I don't know if I've told you my Sid Thrift story. If I told you my Sid Thrift story, I think I have. The fact is, if you tell me a name or tell me something and I've never heard of him, I'm going to tell you. I don't know who that is. I'm okay. I'm not embarrassed by that. There's someone named Ross Blacklock. I had never heard of him. He is the defensive tackle for TCU. He went to the combine, and apparently at the combine, you have to run like 40-yard dashes, and you have to jump and throw passes and... Half the players participate, some don't. It's an entire whole Megilla. Well, Ross Blacklock was in a meeting with the Las Vegas Raiders. The new, that's the Oakland Raiders who moved to Las Vegas. This is their first combine as the Las Vegas Raiders. And in this meeting, <laughs> it's hard to imagine, right? The Raiders told him that he had 37 unpaid parking tickets. 37 paid parking tickets and asked him, like, you have 37 outstanding parking tickets. I thought they were outstanding. I'm hearing from Coca they were paid because he said they were paid from some fund that he didn't know about. Did he actually say that? Okay, here's my question. When you're looking at a player and you're thinking about drafting him, I can barely understand analytics in terms of why at the Combine we need a guy to run the 40-yard dash and why we need him to see what, how high his vertical leap is and how fast or how far he can throw, pass, punt, skip, jump, step. What about the parking tickets? What about that is correlated to how Ross Blacklock will do as a professional football player? Oh, I know what you're saying. All right, you're right. I'm wrong. It goes to character. Why would I ever want in the world to draft a player who has unpaid parking tickets? You're right. If they're paid, it's fine. Well, wait a minute. If you have 37 parking tickets, doesn't that speak to your character more than the fact that you actually paid them? What's the thing that you think of when you think parking ticket? What is it? Anybody? What's the first thought that you have? Yes, I agree. Illegal parking. Double parking, parking in a handicap spot, parking and not putting money in the meter, parking on a yellow line. Those are all examples of how you get a parking ticket. Can you please DM me if you've gotten 37 parking tickets in your life? And then I'd like to know your age. 
If you're telling me that you had 37 parking tickets and on top of that you didn't even know about them, I'm thinking to myself, I don't care about running, passing, skipping, or jumping. I'm thinking, I'm not sure if you have a brain. And I think that in order to understand our system and our schemes, you really do have to understand what we're doing, like understand our playbook. And this is not me criticizing the intelligence of Ross Blacklock. I don't know him. I couldn't pick him out. I literally have no idea what he looks like. It doesn't matter to me. I want to know why he would get 37 parking tickets. I don't want to know why he didn't know that's part two of my study. How do you get them? How can you be so egotistical or so full of reckless indifference toward the law that you will accumulate 37 parking tickets? That's query number one. Query number two, how do they all get paid from an account that you have and you have no idea? It's beyond comprehension. It's beyond rational belief. And the best thing he does is comes up with a quote that says, good thing because I ain't got no bad record. Coca, that's not a quote. So if you're watching on YouTube, he all these sort of graphics are done by Coca. If you're listening, which I appreciate, you can't see what he's doing. Coca, good thing because I ain't got no bad record. Is that Ross talking or is that you talking? I don't know why that would be you talking. Are you telling me that this guy, Ross Blacklock, said that good thing because I ain't got no bad record? I, what does that even mean? It's a good thing that he had the tickets paid off because he was worried if he didn't, he'd then have a bad record? It's a good thing that he didn't know about the 37 tickets because they were paid off from an account that he doesn't have control of? There's nothing good about this story. There's nothing good about the Combine other than the fact that Tommy Tran got to go to Indianapolis for a month. Do you think the Minnesota Timberwolves will miss 25 grand? That's my question. So I ran a team for 18 years, and let me tell you that um, we wouldn't miss 25 grand. And that sounds terrible, and I'm, it, it, I get it. I understand the insanity of what I'm saying. When you're dealing with a budget, of hundreds of millions of dollars in a billion dollar industry, a $25,000 fine, it's not, uh, it doesn't register. The Minnesota Timberwolves were fined $25,000 for load management resting of D'Angelo Russell. It's the first time the NBA has fined a team for illegal load management application of the rule. D'Angelo Russell it was a road game on NBA TV. That's the channel owned by the NBA. There is a huge money at involved, involved that the best players play when teams play on NBA TV. So the NBA decides to make an example of the Timberwolves. And they decide to do it with $25,000. The next time that there's a uh, tragedy the next time that there's a hurricane, a major weather event, some, some cause that attracts the attention of all of you. And then a team stands up and says, I pledge $100,000 to this cause. I did it. We've done that as a team. The Marlins would give money away. We would do check presentations for five grand, 10 grand, 20 grand, 25 grand. It's very meaningful to the companies who are getting the money. When you do a grant from your community foundation of $5,000 to an organization that needs that money to function, that will take that money to expand programs to benefit underserved kids or adults with or without disabilities, five grand, 10 grand, they make a difference. In the real world, five, ten, fifteen, twenty-five thousand dollars is a lot of money. Where everybody listening, watching, me included, everybody would know and would say, "Wow, that money's missing from my account." Wow, I can't believe I just had a write at twenty-five thousand dollar check. That is meaningful. But when you find a sports team twenty-five thousand dollars, and you are doing it to make a point about load management, you haven't made the point. 
the Minnesota Timberwolves. It's not. It's like I want you to picture a flea on the rump of an elephant in the middle of the Serengeti. All you do is shake your butt a little bit, move your trunk a tiny bit, maybe shoot a little dust on it, and the flea will go away. And that's it. You don't get bitten. You don't have to scratch it. You don't need Benadryl. Nothing. For 25 grand, the Minnesota Timberwolves look at that and say, you know what? I'll rest D'Angelo Russell anytime I want. It's not helpful to the NBA's mandate to cut down load management violations. I was always in favor, always in favor of huge fines to teams, even my own. I wanted fines to be a deterrent. We talked about when the Astros were fined $5 million and you all thought that was nothing. $5 $5 million is a major, major, major fine. Whether it's a billionaire owner, a millionaire owner, any owner, that is a major fine for the sign-stealing scandal. $25,000 will not even register. And by the way, Coca is putting up for you all to see on YouTube that Russell is making $27 million this season. That is totally irrelevant, Matthew, because the fine was to the Timberwolves, not to D'Angelo Russell. So it doesn't matter what D'Angelo Russell was making. By the way, if you're making $27 million, when we would fine a player twenty five grand, even the rich players, when we'd fine them, that was major money to them. That is a big deal. The NBA could have done better. They should have done better. I was just trying to think, do I care that D'Angelo Russell didn't play on NBA TV against the Nuggets? Nah. Yeah, I have NBA TV. Coke Coke is whispering to me here. Do you even have NBA TV? Of course I have NBA TV. NBA happens to be my first love, Matthew. The Knicks are my were my the love of my life were the New York Knicks. Okay, pick of the day. Uh, you know how we won yesterday, right? You remember how we won a game because you bet on Carmelo Anthony? An absolute outrage that we bet the Blazers not to lose by more than eight and a half to the Pacers and they only lost by six. And Carmelo, with his 12 points, was the difference maker. Thank you, Carmelo. What a joke. All right, we got a game you got to watch tonight. That's why I want you to play it, because you're going to watch it. You might as well have some action or get some action on the game. Nuggets, plus five and a half over the Clippers. This is the number two seed against the number three seed in the Western Conference. They're both chasing the Los Angeles Lakers. The interesting part about this game, to me, the Clippers have not been playing as well as they had been playing before the break. You had some little bit of infighting creeping out publicly, saying we've got to be better. We've got to play better. Anytime there's any sort of public outcry by players on stuff that should be kept in the clubhouse, I always have a tendency to go against that team. Nuggets, Jokic, love them. Love them. Nuggets are going to not just cover, they're going to actually win. Nuggets, five and a half over the clip joint. Okay, so on the Wait to See, I spent some time on this. We end each show with Wait to See. Wait to See is a, um, you know what it is, right? If this is your first show, thank you. Go back and listen to the previous 82 episodes. Wait to See is when we tell you something that's going to happen. Either it will or either it won't, but it's binary. I'm either going to be right or I'm going to be wrong. We started this show today. And I thank you, by the way, they measure something called retention, which is how long you listen to the show. And the overwhelming majority, 90 to 95% of you are listening to 100% of the show. And that's amazing. So thank you. So the show has ended with a tiny way to see. This one's about Des Bryant. We started the show with Jerry Jones. We're going to end it with Jerry Jones. Des Bryant, he's the one who was showering with Jerry Jones, and he's the one that The question was, do we sign him or do we not sign him? And Jones was washing his back with his loofah, and he was saying, ah, you know, I really got to think about this, and I thought about it. I've got a lot of thoughts on this, and I really think that he's someone who could be very helpful. And then the soap falls down, and then he washes his feet, washes his seven strands of hair, combs a complete comb over, and comes out and says, you know what I just decided? Des Bryant, you're not going to be a cowboy. Wait to see. Des Bryant will not be signed by the Dallas Cowboys for the simple reason that Jerry Jones ran out of hot water. The shower got cut short. He'll call him up. You know what's coming next, folks. He'll call up Des and he'll say, hey, Des, I love you, man. But I'm the GM of this team 
And it's just business, Des. It's nothing personal.